Hey everyone, welcome to Ex Bundy Diaries. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, her, and as promised, this is another homeschooling video. I've got stories, I've got journal entries, so let's get into the details. As I shared in my last video, seventh grade was my most isolating homeschool year, but eighth through 12th grade, I wasn't nearly as isolated. But I want to explain more in depth what I mean by that because that statement has a few caveats. The first caveat is that being less isolated simply meant that I got to see more kids my age on an ongoing, semi-regular basis. I was no longer wishing for my DVD curriculum to have videos of recess time so I could watch other kids interacting with each other, because I myself now had the opportunity to interact with other kids. However, they all came from extremely similar families to mine, experiencing almost the same hyper-religious indoctrinations. The social world we inhabited was a cis, heteronormative, mostly white, Christian nationalist homeschool bubble. Say that five times fast. Not only did we rarely, if ever, build relationships with people who were different in lifestyle, beliefs, and worldview, but we were taught to see them as lost, sinful, and even dangerous others. To explain this another way, when I was a teenager, I watched the movie The Village, and I related to it in such a deep, visceral way that I couldn't even fully understand or put into words. Now, the reason is obvious to me. The control tactics used by the leaders and parents in that movie mirrored the ones used in the separatist cult that I was being raised in. I know that when I say cult, many people are going to have a specific idea in their mind of what that looks like. I would recommend checking out the bite model. The way I was raised matches that criteria. So despite being less isolated in eighth through 12th grade in a physical and practical sense, I was always isolated from the world beyond our beliefs and our worldview. And that brings me to another caveat. Just because I was less physically isolated than before did not mean that my loneliness went away. Growing up with the foundational framework of being in and not of the world meant that I had to always maintain a certain level of detachment from both my true self and from everyone around me, with the one exception to that being my parents and my siblings, with whom I was deeply enmeshed and was allowed to have almost no boundaries. I was trained to always put them in the best light to others, hiding as best I could our dysfunction and the abuse that was happening. Since many of my homeschool friends and acquaintances were doing the same thing with their own families, it created an atmosphere of fakeness, of smiling and pretending that everything's fine and keeping each other at a certain distance. Of course, I didn't realize any of this until recent years. But what I remember from how I felt during that time was that I was always eager to go closer to others, that I felt this disconnection with the friends that I did have, and I always wanted to deepen our friendships. Even with the one group of kids that I felt the most connected to, my Awana group, I still couldn't be fully myself. My behavior was monitored by my mom and by all the other moms and older girls around me. That's what you do in a cult. You keep yourself and others in line. And in a deeply patriarchal cult, with very strict gender roles and power differences, the women have the specific role of supervising all of the kids who are being raised as girls. For me, being queer was especially difficult when being forced into such a rigid version of femininity and what was seen as appropriate, godly, female behavior. And I'm sure that many women who don't identify as queer have also had this experience. I suppressed my queerness, but not enough to be held up as an example of a good Christian girl. Though I was mostly well-liked and accepted in my Awana group, I could tell that there were some women and older girls who were always watching me. 
I would shrivel under their gaze and do my best to rein myself in. But their little comments said with a smile would sting and fill me with shame. I started to get a reputation as a certain kind of girl, a girl who meant well and who clearly loved Jesus, but who had some weaknesses when it came to being not quiet and gentle and feminine enough. Too loud, too outgoing, too hyper. I was never truly able to be myself. And when I say that, I am speaking from my own identities as a white, queer, cisgender woman. I know there are so many nuances when it comes to race and gender and other marginalized identities that I cannot personally speak to. My white and cis privilege protected me from so much harm that others have faced and continue to face in Christian fundamentalism because of the racism and transphobia that is so embedded in those structures. I also know that Christian patriarchy hurts everyone, including cishet men. The whole thing is just so toxic and harmful. So, with everything I've shared so far in mind, I'd like to walk you through the social progression of my middle school and high school years. Here's a brief overview. It began with a very traumatic seventh grade year, which led into a much better eighth grade experience as I settled into my Awana group. I still felt out of place in other homeschool and Christian settings, and of course on my secular soccer teams, but Awana was a grounding experience. Then right before 11th grade, that group was set off balance with some drama and my social world was shaken. But things improved in 12th grade when I expanded my social circle with this group of homeschool Christians who came together from all over the area for a homeschool graduation. All through seventh grade, I longed for friends. During part of this year, I wrote in this Jesus Freak journal, which was made by the Christian band DC Talk. It was a companion journal to their books about martyrs called Jesus Freaks. Every page of this journal had a little dose of indoctrination in the margins. There were Bible verses, mini stories, and thought starters that were asking me questions like, would I be willing to die for Jesus and other persecution complex shit like that. So every time I went to write, I was reminded that I needed to invalidate my own feelings, sacrifice for the Lord, and make sure I was suffering and thanking God for my suffering because it was bringing me closer to Christ. Here's an entry a month before I turned 13 that I think really encapsulates my seventh grade experience. The indoctrination part on the side says, the father is a merciful God who always gives us comfort. We share in the terrible sufferings of Christ, but also in the wonderful comfort he gives. Paul the apostle, martyred in Rome, AD 65. January 14th, 2004. It seems like everything is whizzing by this year. There are so many things I want to write in this journal, but so little time, or so it seems. I can't seem to focus on one thing because there are so many thoughts going on in my mind, it's confusing. I'll be talking to Jesus and then start to think of something else. And then I forget what I was saying to him. It seems like my life is so busy. It seems like I have no time at all to write or practice soccer or read or just pray for people and spend time with God because I'm too busy with chores, schoolwork, helping mom, watching Ivor or playing with Annie. I want to spend time with God. How can I be a Jesus freak without getting to know him? I want him to speak to me. Dad says I don't just be still and listen, but to me, I don't have time. I want more friends. It seems like I don't have any. I know I do, but I don't have time to see them. Well, I want to write more, but as it is, I still have two English lessons to do. P.S. When will I have time to be thankful? What will I be thankful for? As seventh grade was coming to a close, my mom and I visited a Christian homeschool academy that met two times a week. She wanted me to go there for eighth grade 
so that I would have more instruction as school subjects got harder. That summer, my cousin came to stay with us for a month. He went to public school and was my main window to the outside world. I looked up to him and was highly influenced by his opinions. And I often felt caught between wanting to be more like him and wanting to obey my parents. As eighth grade approached and my cousin was still staying with us, my mom told me that she wasn't so sure anymore about sending me to the homeschool academy because she was concerned about how I might behave around other kids and that I might not put my family in the best light. August 10th, 2004. I've got something on my heart right now. It's what mom just told me. It's actually kind of confusing to me, but I know what I need to do. Mom said she wasn't so excited about the homeschool academy anymore because of the kids and how I might act. She said, I need to work on the way I act when I'm with other people. She said with my immediate family, I'm a gem, always helping out and including everyone. But when I'm with others, I sort of diss my family because I think it's cool or something. She pointed out what I said last night when she and my cousin were talking about stuff having to do with high school. And I said, I wish I went to public school. Why did I say that? That comment made mom look like a bad parent. Sadly, I do know why I said that, I think anyway. It seems like I need to prove myself to my cousins and friends. I want to be cool or right in their eyes. I found myself this past week making decisions according to my cousin, so as to have something in common with him. I thought that I was tired of being a Christian in this world because of myself, and most things, that's true. But some things, only some things, I want to do because my friends and or my cousin can do them, because their parents are led differently or are not Christians. I'm really wrestling with the fact that these aren't things that just mom and dad don't want me to do. It's what God wants me to do too. Isn't my love for him stronger than any of my worldly wants? I know what I need to do. I need to stop trying to be what I think my cousin would want for a younger cousin and just be Ellie, God's Ellie, a Jesus freak. In spite of my mom's fears about how I may behave unsupervised around other kids, she did end up sending me to the homeschool academy that met two times a week for eighth grade and some years following. I had a couple of friends there, but for the most part, I still felt very out of place. Even though these were fellow homeschoolers who came from Christian families, they seemed to be quite a bit more worldly than me. Many of these kids dated, swore, listened to secular music, made dirty jokes, and did a bunch of other things that I wasn't allowed to do. So I felt pressured to keep my distance and not give in to the temptation to rebel and join them in their worldly habits. The other thing about this homeschool academy and another homeschool academy that I attended in later years is that they were both affiliated with a specific church and they met on that church's campus. So most of the kids who went to these academies also attended those churches and they were involved in a lot of church activities together, like the worship team and youth group. My family always went to other churches and did a lot of church hopping, including having periods of time where we would just have home church or we would go and visit random churches every couple of weeks. Growing up, church was never a place that felt like home for me. And part of that was that we never stayed at one specific church for longer than a few years. The other part is that I always felt this divide between me and other kids my age. My family was so reclusive and my social skills were so underdeveloped from being homeschooled. I almost never went to youth groups unless my parents made me go or unless I knew someone there that I could cling to the entire night. When I had the choice, I always opted to stay with my parents in big church, which was the regular service. 
every time we were visiting a new church or we were on vacation, my mom would encourage me to go to the youth group. And if I had to go, I would get intense social anxiety and I would count the moments until it was over. I feel like there's a stereotype in pop culture about youth group kids being uncool. But to a homeschool cult kid like me, youth group kids were extremely cool and very intimidating. They were the be a light at public school kind of kids whose ministry was turning down drinks at parties. So many of the lessons that were taught in youth group were completely irrelevant to me because I had such a different life. For example, no need to remember that God is always watching while I'm on the internet because we didn't have the internet. And no need to learn how to say no to peer pressure to sin because I had no peers pressuring me to sin. These lessons just made me feel like I didn't belong. The only place where I felt relatively safe and relaxed and like I did belong was my Awana group. Oh, it's a Hallmark moment. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna count to three. Say cheese. Cheese. I said when I count to three. <laughs> One. Say something like Holy Spirit or something. Okay. Holy <laughs> One, two, three. Cheese. I started to see this group as my family, as my home away from home. I wanted to spend as much time with them as possible, so missing a weekly Awana meeting felt devastating. Summers were the most lonely of all since Awana wasn't in session, but we had a yearly family camping trip and a couple of other get-togethers here and there. The summer before 11th grade, my Awana group started to have some drama for the first time. A boy and a girl in our group liked each other, but the girl wasn't allowed to date. So a few of the other kids set up a group outing to the mall as a front so that the boy and the girl could have their first secret date. I and a few other kids weren't invited to this, but people gossiped and the news spread quickly. When I had discovered what happened, I felt pretty left out. But what was even stronger than that feeling was my fear that I was going to lose this safe environment where I didn't have to rebel in order to fit in. I wasn't sure if I should still stay in the group and prayed about whether or not I should quit Awana. In my last video, I talked about the large Christian private school that I did soccer and drama at through the independent study program. Going into 11th grade, I actually had the opportunity to attend that school full time. I can't remember why, but after years of begging my mom to let me go to an actual school, she was finally open to it. By that time, I had been homeschooled and isolated from the world for so long that I was terrified. And when my mom took me to take the placement test, school had already been in session for a whole week. So not only would I be going to a large school with lockers and an actual quad, for the first time, but I would be starting out an entire week behind. I remember that the bell rang as we were waiting to go into the office, and there was an explosion of sound as the students walked to their next classes. I watched them talking and laughing together as they were striding confidently to wherever they needed to go next, and I started to panic. My heart was pounding, I could feel myself shrinking, and I just wanted to go home. Even though going to a five-day physical school was one of my deepest longings, I didn't feel like I could handle it. Predictably, I ultimately decided to stay in Awana and to not go to the private school. Here is 16-year-old me reflecting on both of those decisions. September 2nd, 2007. It has been much too long since I have recorded what God is doing in my life. And let me say, he is doing a lot. I feel this is a huge growing up time for me. The Lord is hurling multiple challenges at me and I am striving to overcome. I believe the two biggest challenges of all right now are truly falling in love with Christ, something I long for, 
and staying at peace with my life, no matter what my circumstances. What a lesson to learn. True joy is something I long for as well. To put it plainly, the Awana group and those associated with are really my group of friends. They're really the only group I've got. And so many times lately, I've wanted to pull out and find another group. Where I'd find one, I have no idea. But if it is God's will for me to leave Awana, he would help me find another place to go. He would keep me satisfied. However, underlined, it is not his will. A few weeks ago, he spoke to me and made it clear I need to stay. I was talking to him one day as I stood by the living room window looking out. God, I was saying, what is going on with Awana? Everything's falling apart. And just like that, almost as if he was speaking in my head, I heard, I am doing things in Awana. I am working and moving. Before I realized I had just recognized the Lord speaking to me, I right away said, well, what do you want me to do? He answered with one word, wait. A very convenient answer that I heard many times, many, many times. Okay, Lord, I said. Suddenly, joy washed over me when the realization of God's voice hit me. I couldn't stop a silly grin spreading all over my face. God loves me. I love him, and he speaks to me personally, and I know it's him, and I choose to follow his will. Another amazing thing that happened to me lately was when I almost went to the large Christian private school full time. I didn't know what to do. I was so torn and the decision was really up to me. I prayed a ton about it, sleepless nights and waking moments. And I strongly asked God to give me a conviction I could not ignore. To be honest, I doubted he would give it to me because I didn't know if I could recognize what is of the Lord and what is made up or contrived. But then it happened, at God's perfect timing. We were in the office with the principal's assistant or someone important like that. And she asked me if I really wanted to do this. And right then, I knew the answer was no. God didn't want me to go to that school. When she went out of the room, after I had given my polite answer, mom said, honey, are you sure? And I said, yes, mom. God gave me the conviction I asked for. I am so at peace. And she was overjoyed and rejoiced with me. And now I know that I am meant to stay with Awana. The only reasons I can think of are, number one, God will change things for the better in the group. Number two, he is giving me a challenge to grow in. Or number three, he's going to use me in some way. He's used me already. The past six months, I have really represented light as my friends and others have made bad decisions and I have not been a part of it. And then in, <laughs> in parentheses, I put, I say that in all humility. <laughs> Choosing the right thing is hard. It wouldn't be hard if your friends did it too, but that's not life, is it? It's not always hard. I'm happy to be who I am and make decisions for Christ daily. But being known as the goody two-shoes is hard. The other night, one of the boys was trying to gossip to me about some other boy, and I stopped him in his sentence. What should we call him? Trevor. I don't think I know any Trevors. Trevor, I said, thank you, but I don't want to hear it. Trevor huffed and replied, you never do. And all I did was laugh. So even in my Awana group, I started to be known as the goody two-shoes. And that was kind of my label wherever I went. It was very lonely. And obviously I was very judgy, but I was raised to be that way. And my parents were really proud of me for it. So continuing in that identity, trying to be a Jesus freak and really owning it was a way to earn their love. Halfway through my senior year, I started to expand my social circle and branch out myself a little bit, only in small ways, nothing too out there. This was all due to the homeschool graduation ceremony. 
kids from all different homeschool groups and co-ops within a 25 mile radius came together to form a graduating class of I think about 30 kids. I knew some of them already from my homeschool groups and some of them I was meeting for the first time. And for about four months leading up to the graduation, we did social activities together. There was a formal banquet, some park hangouts, some trips to the mall, some hikes, things like that. Many of these activities were initiated and planned by us kids and were unsupervised by our parents. It was the most socially independent I had ever been allowed to be. Traipsing around with a big group of homeschool seniors who were as dorky and repressed as me. Except for like a small handful of kids who were definitely more rebellious but very good at keeping it under the radar. I actually almost went clubbing with a couple of them, but my guilt won out in the end. But unfortunately, that was also right in the middle of a lot of family chaos. So every time I left a super fun experience with my graduating class, I went home to our own mini hell. The fact that my family environment wasn't safe made it so that there was almost nowhere where I could truly relax. It was very, very exhausting. Okay, Q&A time. I got some great thoughtful questions about homeschooling and I'd like to answer those now. Thank you so much to everyone who asked. This is a topic that I'm really passionate about and I really appreciate people being so interested. The first question is, wondering if you think there is a correct way to homeschool. For me, the most important part of choosing to homeschool is the reason for doing so. I believe that raising your children to be in and not of the world is not a valid reason because this reason is only going to harm them and ultimately to negatively impact society. It will most likely result in a lack of social skills, a terrible education, an extremist religious worldview, and lasting trauma. It is also often used as a way to cover up abuse, like it was in my family. Lately, I've been reading this book called Lovingly Abused by Heather Grace Heath. Heather was raised in ATI, the Advanced Training Institute by Bill Gothard, which is the cult that the Duggar family were a part of. I wasn't raised in ATI, but I relate to so much of what Heather shares in her beautiful book, especially when it comes to homeschooling. I wanna read a quote from chapter five, which is called Homeschool Heather. Homeschooling in and of itself isn't evil in my mind. The way I was homeschooled was. I fully support families who homeschool because it's the best thing for that individual child and who provide a valid equal education to the one available in traditional schools. I understand there are many reasons to homeschool outside of being commanded to do so by your cult. And she lists school shootings as well as the pandemic as a couple of those examples. I know several families who decided to homeschool after that, but who went about it in a way that would uplift and support their child rather than hide them. The choice and or need to homeschool today through a pandemic is much different than the one made by parents like mine. Many families, including mine, used the guise of religious freedom, but that was as much a scapegoat to endanger children as it is when used as a reason against life-saving medical care. And in the introduction, she says, there is a difference between avoiding a global pandemic and avoiding reality. That difference is where the abuse lies. And I also wanna point out that here on page 100, she says, I acknowledge the deep unforgivable trauma that abounds in a school setting. My small observation is not intended to invalidate anyone's experience. And I wanna acknowledge that too. I know there is so much harm done to children in school settings, including public school, for so many different reasons. And that is obviously totally valid as well. I personally can only speak to homeschooling because that's all that I knew. Other than a very small strict Anglican school that mirrored a lot of the things that were happening through homeschooling. 
But I totally agree with Heather's view of homeschooling. And I love the way that she says that some families uplift and support their children rather than hiding them. I think that's the correct way to homeschool. That being said, I had such a negative homeschool experience that it's hard for me to even imagine what that would look like. I am very biased against homeschooling, but I'm sure there are many people who have genuinely positive experiences. And I would guess that the reason they were homeschooled had a lot to do with that. The next question is, I am wondering if you know about Coalition for Responsible Homeschool Education and the work they do with kids getting out of this situation. Yes, I do. I love that organization and actually so does Heather and she mentions them in Lovingly Abused. I am so grateful for the advocacy work that they do for kids who are growing up in upbringings so similar to mine. Thank you so much for bringing them up. I will put a link to their website in the description box so that anyone who wants to check them out can. The last question is, I'd love to hear about what you and your siblings, for example, Annie, have done since high school to further educate yourselves. I actually answered this question in a previous Q&A, so I'll put that video in the cards and you're welcome to go watch my in-depth answer, but I'll also give a quick overview in this video. Right after homeschooling, I went to a local community college for about a year and a half. Then I spent a year at an accredited Christian university. And then after that, I finished my bachelor's degree in psychology online. So I learned a lot in those educational settings, but I'm also committed to my own lifelong learning through researching and reading books and taking classes. Annie has also done further education, but I don't want to speak for them. So maybe if they come back onto my channel at some point, they can share their experience with that. Thank you so much again for asking those questions. I think that was all of them, but if I missed any, feel free to let me know in the comments. If there is one thing that I hope people will take away from watching this video, it's that homeschooling your children for the purpose of isolating them from the world creates loneliness. It doesn't matter how many extra activities you do or how many homeschool groups or co-ops or academies you're a part of. The structure of being in and not of the world is inherently isolating. With this worldview, your baseline is disconnection. You must always maintain a level of disconnect from yourself and from others around you because you are meant to remain unaffected and unattached, simply a traveler in this world. Accepting the reality of the way that I was raised feels so heavy sometimes. I'm still dealing with the ramifications of my parents' choice, and I think I always will be to some extent. I can't change it, but I can share my story in hopes that others who know this grief will feel less alone. I can tell my younger self that she deserved better. I can be grateful that I got out in time to spare my daughter from that trauma. And I can keep moving forward, whatever that looks like, in hopes of more connection and more belonging. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Version of femininity, femininity, <laughs> It's a hard word to say. Version of femininity. Of femininity. Femininity. Version of femininity. 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 <laughs> I feel like Nemo trying to say see an enemy.